Hi, and welcome to Tea and Strumpets, a Regency Romance Review. I'm Zoe. And I'm Kelsey. And I went to a very exciting show last night. Oh, gosh. (laughs) I am so jealous, but I want to hear all about it. Well, Zoe, I'm very sad you couldn't come with me because you missed a fantastic show. So last night, I got to see one of a live show recording of The Guilty Feminist. So for those who don't know, The Guilty Feminist is hosted by comedian Deborah Francis White, and she's hilarious, and it's all about being a feminist, but also embracing your femininity. So it's okay. You can still be a feminist and like to go have your toes done. (laughs) And so much more. Yeah, I think their tagline is, the show about feminism in today's modern world and all the hypocrisies that undermines it or something to yeah, that effect. Exactly. So mm-hmm. it's it's one of my favorite podcasts. And this was their first US tour. They're always going yes. to the UK because they're in the UK, but they're always yeah. going to Australia and New Zealand. And I'm like, come over here. I really want to see you. No. And they finally did. And like, as soon as they announced they're doing a North American tour, I was like, where are they going? And sure enough, they came to San Francisco. And Ugh. I was like, I'm there. I promise I'm there. And I tried to get you up here, Zoe, but it didn't work I out. I know. I am I was really <laughs> bummed, but I'm so excited you saw them. And you sound so inspired from all of the empowering conversations. And Oh, it was absolutely wonderful. And it was great, too, because I brought a friend who just heard the title of the show and was like, sounds fun, <laughs> but had no idea what she was getting into. And by the end of it, she's like, thank you so much for inviting me. I thoroughly enjoyed that. And I just was very happy to share it with her because I was so excited. And then we could like, we were able to just talk about it and gush about it. And if you check our Twitter, you will see a photo of DFW and I together. So yay. So cool. Lucky, lucky you. I am jealous and inspired by your guilty feminist experience. I have a question for you, Kelsey. All righty. In fact, it's the one that they always start with on the guilty feminist. (laughs) So Kelsey, have you had a guilty week or a feminist week? I think I had a bit of a both week. Really? Tell me all about it. Yes. I had some self-doubting moments where I was like, had basically a complete like unraveling with my husband. Mm. And then it was really nice though, because then I feel like I married a very feminist man because then the next day he like cleaned all the dishes and I didn't even have to ask. (laughs) And I was like, because he was like, she needs to like have her moment. <laughs> a very supportive husband. That's really nice. Yes. And I just like, I loved it because I woke up, I heard him doing the dishes in the morning and I was like, I didn't even ask. That's so nice. <laughs> yeah. Support when you need it. Doing things for your partner that you just know will make them happy. Even yes. when it's not your natural inclination. It's so, <laughs> so nice. I get that. So You also had a feminist week because you went to see The Guilty Feminist. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. I went to see The Guilty Feminist, therefore a very feminist week. Yes. But Zoe, how about you? Is your week guilty or feminist? I think my week was pretty feminist. Uh, This week I got to do some feminist editing, shall we say. Um, (laughs) uh, Bless him. But a young male family member who is close to me was writing a piece and asked me to look it over. And while the piece was really personal and I appreciated what he was trying to convey within the piece, he had a line that was... Unfortunately, just from a very narrow minded place of privilege. And I got (laughs) to call him out on that. And I actually was really happy that I got to do so because I don't think that he was malicious at all. But he it was a good learning experience, right? To say that, like, Mm -hmm. that's how this comes off. This is coming off from a very, you know, white, straight, middle class man point of view. And you should be more considerate of the people who may or may not be reading what you're writing. And also more than that, you should evolve as a person from this sort of, (laughs) this sort of, you know, view. And I know it maybe sounds worse than it was, but, um, it just, it, no, it's okay. You, you told me about it and I a hundred (laughs) percent, I agree with what you're saying. And I agree with like, his message was there. He just needed to think about the way that it was coming out, see it through a different lens. Yeah. He needed to, he needed to read it as the viewer. Mm -hmm. He needed to write it as the viewer reading it, not as himself just kind of being like, 
Uh. And he's a he's a very young gentleman. And so that's just part of his evolution because I actually know him to be very sensitive and caring. So that's really – it's not a reflection of his character. And it was a growing no. and learning moment. And I was very happy to like be like – Excuse me. <laughs> so felt the feminism. Also, this week, we felt very female empowered by this wonderful interview we just had with a very special guest. Yes. And we are so excited to share that interview with you momentarily. So I just want to say that I met this author at a signing event and she is just a wonderful person and we hit it off so much and she was so generous with her time and we even got coffee together and we got to gush about our dogs and The Bachelor and we don't do that on today's <laughs> program, which is maybe a shame, but uh, I just can't wait to share our chat with her with all of you and hopefully open up some of you guys if you haven't already read her amazing books to her amazing books. Also, quick apology, listeners. We did have some technical difficulties at the beginning of the episode, but then we fixed them. So if there's any sort of like weird changes in audio, like we were just fixing things on the go. Yes. So without further ado, let's get into our chat with Kerrigan Byrne. So today we are joined by an author of not only spectacular historical romance, but also mystery. We are thrilled to have the fabulous Kerrigan Byrne on the podcast with us today. Kerrigan, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. We are so excited to have you. And listeners, if you haven't read Kerrigan's books yet, um, well, I'm actually really excited for you because they are great. And I still have a couple of your books in your catalog left. So I'm holding them like little treats for when I need them. Oh, oh, <laughs> best. No worries. <laughs> it's still weird for me to ever hear that I have a catalog or that this is what I do for my life. So <laughs> yeah, I can't really imagine as I am not a an author. But uh, it's just a a crazy thing. I think I imagine to have people come talk to you mm. about your books. I, I, and we're doing that here today. So, <laughs> <laughs> so Kerrigan, we like to break the ice with the toughest question so that everything is just easier from here. So we're just going to get it out of the way. So are you ready? I'm ready. Do you have a favorite romance <laughs> novel? And if so, what is it? <laughs> uh, okay. Um, <laughs> I like I thought about this for a very long time and all I could think about is that I say one thing I'm there are all of these other great ones that I'm not saying and so that makes me feel weird <laughs> but um and mm -hmm. squirmy inside but I there's one that I keep going back to and it's it's because every time I'm stuck I open this because it always gets my engine going as a writer and as a reader and like it's Karen Marie Monning's Dark Highlander and so Ooh. I I don't know if it's like my favorite of all time, but I just uh, love it so much, <laughs> you know. And I and I read it all of the time just because I I feel like I want to emulate her, and it I don't know, just everything about that hero just gets me. That's really cool. I am not familiar with that book, so now that. Um... <laughs> is going to go on my list uh, because I love your books. So things that are you're inspired uh -huh. by, I think are, would be like a really cool read as well. I just, I mean, I, I <laughs> well, feel very so read, I think that. it's, it's the Highlander first you have to read because they're, it's their twin brothers and the first brothers for, oh, yeah. Okay. And the second brother second. So um, <gasps> they might not be twins. Maybe they're just brothers. I'm the worst person. I think they're twins. Anyway, there's Dr <laughs> there's Dristan and Dagus McKelter. And um See, I would remember the brother thing, but I would uh, not remember the names to save my oh, life. Yeah. So well, like I already all you're like so much further off. <laughs> I read it all else. the time. I read it like all the time. And I do read both, but they have that kind of dichotomy of like one brother's the like blonde hero Superman guy who does everything right and he's the knight in shining armor. And then the other brother is like possessed by 13 ancient demons because he does bad things and like 
Oh, yeah, and it's very, oh. you know, and like he's okay. kind of kidnappy, which is fun. And <laughs> you know, so like and it's, it's like a time travel, it's like a time travel, <laughs> Scottish time travel written probably 10 or so years ago because Karen Karen Monning mm. does almost wow, almost exclusively urban fantasy now and she has for quite some time and i read those books too but it's a totally different totally different feel than her it's a different earlier. Ball game. Yeah. that's a different yeah. yeah and so this one has a fantasy element because it, it's paranormal because either the women fall back in time or the men come forward in time which is both adorable and fun um but it's pre-outlander mm. It's, mm. so it's you know <laughs> She was doing Scottish time travel through the stones before that became cool, yeah. you know? So it was Ha-ha. great. Yeah. Like I just, and they're <laughs> just every, like she's like balances that perfect amount of like witty and funny and sexy and dark and really poignant kind of thing. So I just love that about her. Wow. That sounds like a great recommendation. And I think it's interesting because I actually, the the most recent book of yours that I mm-hmm. have read is The Highlander. So I feel some of the inspiration there. In fact, as I was reading it, I even thought like, are we going <laughs> to get a little paranormal element in here? You know, I, I wasn't sure if that one character was, you know, a, a person oh. or maybe some sort of spirit. And I thought it was, you know, I felt very much like it was a, a person. <laughs> Person. But then I was like, but, but, I, but this is really like intriguing. Scotland, and Scotland. Anything I can was happen, there for it. You know? so. <laughs> so, um, Scotland's a magical place. So yeah, I hear. Yeah, yeah. Me too. I want to go over there. I wrote the Victorian Rebels as a paranormal series to begin with. They were supposed to be werewolves. And so oh. um, then my agent was like, I can't sell paranormal to save my life. So write them again. And I was like, okay. So I did. But I really, I have moments where I'm like, but wouldn't they have made great werewolves though? <laughs> you know? <laughs> like, you know? So. so did you really have like full books written or was it, what was that like when you had to go back? Just one. It, I just had one about three fourths of the way written and it was actually the Highlander. The Highlander was going to be first and the Liam was the only man who was not a werewolf. He was ah. like, he was just the clan chieftain kind of thing. And then. His brother Gavin and Dorian and Arjun, all the guys were were werewolves, and they that's why they did bad things. Just because it's more permissible, and there are worse things that you can have the monsters do because they cannot help it, rather than you write a man yeah. and you have to definitely make him redeemable. Whereas like a monster, you can kind of be like, well, I mean, he kind of almost killed her, but what what are you gonna do? You know. <laughs> what you... It wasn't him at the time. Yeah, no, exactly. He had teeth. He was hungry. I mean, <laughs> I've done some terrible things to meet that. You know. <laughs> well, I think that's that's really interesting, though, because I really do think you have such a knack for bringing the reader around to the redemption. A lot of your characters in the Victoria Rebel series have a darker past or have a dangerous past or have done things that maybe we don't see in a lot of historical romance handled so delicately. And I think in in another author's hands, a lot of your heroes and heroines would be and and actually mm-hmm. have been considered villains in the story. But like, I think you see the nuances differ and like handle them beautifully. And then what comes out on the page is a person who's not good or bad, but really is a product of their circumstances and deserves a happily ever after. And so I don't know. If I'm summarizing that as well as I could, because again, there's so many nuances to that, but like what drives you to these people and to their stories and wanting to, to tell that? I, I really have always loved that adage about a man has two wolves kind of thing and whichever one you feed is the one that's going to, and I like, I think it's easier for me to create a lot of conflict when you you hit a guy, a hero, at the time in his life where it could go either way. And he has to make decisions whether he's going to be good or bad. And I like think it's fun for a romance to help him make those decisions <laughs> kind of thing. Like he has mm-hmm. where he has some where he's maybe only given the chance in a way to make bad decisions 
and how, you know, you can kind of show like, well, maybe he is hero material. He just never had a chance to be hero material. And then it's fun because then you, you know, there's a chance for enemies and a lot of mm-hmm. internal conflict. And it's really just, you know, an angst and emotion. And I'm finding myself, I, I almost sometimes feel like it's a cop out because I'm writing sort of a, like a quote unquote good guy right now. And I find myself being like, oh, is this boring? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, <laughs> Like, there's not even one one dead body. Uh, like, well, there is one. But, like, you know, <laughs> he didn't do it. <laughs> I So, and I have to dig a little deeper within myself to find those character conflicts. And it's even more nuanced for me to write somebody who isn't struggling with some sort of beast. He's just trying to fall in love, you know? Mm. So it makes me nervous as a writer that I'm not giving him the high, high enough stakes. Mm. So I, Mm. you know, I end up throwing them in there any how, but I fear that that would make me a one dimensional author. So I'm trying to grow beyond that, but I just keep, you know, I just keep going back to, I, I worked, I think in a, in a male dominated industry often. And I just see so many, things between people like men who think who are good guys because like maybe they wear a badge or maybe it's what they do for a living and and criminals or whatever and I just have always seen that like humanity is not as cut and dry as all of that and good and bad is not always what you think it is Mm -hmm. you know and so so often you know the the way men think or they act or people even i mean i'm not just saying males but it depends on how other people perceive them whether they are actually good or not like what side are you wearing a badge while you're doing this thing are you socially acceptable or the right color or the right, have the right background so you're allowed to be a certain way rather than you know would you get thrown in jail <laughs> or whatever so i like to play with those yeah, you know, that's fun for me. That's awesome. And I like that you really are focusing on like the human as a whole. And I like that you said that you're challenging yourself. You don't want to be a one dimensional author. You're challenging yourself to be more. But on that note, I'm going to take it away back. And what was your journey to becoming an author? So like you're now pushing yourself as an oh. author, but how did you even get started? <laughs> <laughs> um, Like ever since I, I mean, I have I've been writing since I was nine years old and it was, it's always been romance, romance and like mystery, like a lot of like, Hmm. here's some romance, but also like scary stuff. Like I've always loved kind of spec fiction and paranormal, you know, Mm -hmm. and, and serial killers and like, and things like that have always been really fun for me, but like always with romance. Mm -hmm. And so I just love creating people. I love, you know, I had a ton of imaginary friends as kids and, I would play Legos with my brother who's like by my age and, you know, like we would totally go storm the castle or like <laughs> pew pew, you know, but then, then the little Lego lady with the red lips had to fall in love with the, he was very patient <laughs> with that. And <laughs> he's like, fine. Uh. And um, I just, I still have notebooks and notebooks of, of writing stories and things like that, that I've done, I've just done forever. And then I, had a really bad fever one time and I had just read actually Karen Marie Monning's it's another story of hers and I can't remember what it's called right now but it was about a berserker okay and I had never heard of them before (laughs) and they're like these old Viking myths about men who when they see blood just go absolutely insane and they kill everybody and I was like that is so hot (laughs) (laughs) so And I had this like fever dream. I was so sick. I had a like 104 fever and about this like Oof. guy who could not speak and he was like beckoning me into a room. And then I woke up and I was like, that was obviously a berserker and he wanted me to go in there, but he could not talk to me because he could not speak. <laughs> and that's super hot. And so I wrote my first novella about Roderick McLaughlin in Unspoken. It's called uh, Highland secret now and he he can't speak he just doesn't have any he does he Mm -hmm. like he was cursed for no so he has to woo this woman with never talking to her and um that was the very first thing that you know and I, i went to a conference on indie publishing and i was like well this is obviously just the weirdest thing ever 
but I'll just throw it up on like, I don't know if I did it well. It's, it was very short. It's novella length. It's only, you know, 115 pages or something, but I just like threw it up on Amazon and people read it and some people loved it. And so I wrote some more and it kind of took off from there. So awesome. I love your self starting attitude. I love that you're just like, I'm putting this out in the world. It's great. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't say I ever thought that it was super great, <laughs> but it was kind of more like, what am I, you know, like, what else am I going to do? I don't have anything finished. I had a really hard time finishing books or finishing projects at all. And so um, this one was short and I'm like, I need to prove myself that I can write something from the beginning all the way through to the end without getting distracted with another story that I love. And so that was the first thing I ever finished. And I was like, well, it's done. <laughs> so I'm gonna let the <laughs> I'm gonna let the world tell me if it's any good or not. And if everybody hates it, I'm gonna get better. Mm-hmm. I know I still wanna get but you know, but I'm never like I'll take it down, change my name <laughs> to you know what I mean? Like take a minute to lick my wounds and then I'll try again later, mm-hmm. you know, and but it it worked out. Anyway, it worked out. So So you started then, I guess, with self publishing and I think that novella series is quite a quite a series now, right? I mean, are, I believe they're all like readable, you know, standalone-ish, but they're the same series. Am mm-hmm. I incorrect? No. Yep. Yeah, that's right. There's nine novellas. That's so many. <laughs> um, so prolific. In total. <laughs> <laughs> and those, those all but there's, have... again, there's, there's four. Very cool. And so you started with self-publishing, but now you work with a publisher for some of your series. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I thought I was going to be a paranormal author. That's what I was. I read almost exclusively paranormal at the time. I wrote almost exclusively paranormal. And so when I started shopping the Victorian Rebels, which it was not called, I don't even remember what it was called, um, (laughs) to agents, (laughs) it was the very first actual book length book that I'd ever written that was like, this is 300, 400 pages. And yeah, and that's when she she picked it up in July of 2014. And she's like, rewrite the werewolf out of this. I did that and we sold it in... October. So I mean, it, everything happened very quickly. It kind of just tumbled into that. And what I didn't realize was, once you publish something with New York, because after I was done after three, I wanted, I wanted Argent and Dorian and Liam's story told and maybe Gavin, but like, I was like, okay, well, now I want to write about gladiators. And they're like, Oh, no, <laughs> no. no, 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 no. Here's what you don't understand. <laughs> like, I like, I have this great gladiator story. And there's like slaves and sex, and it's gonna be fun and some more dead bodies. <laughs> and they're like, here's the thing. You write Victorian romance now. Congratulations. If oh. you want to get crazy, like that's your brand. That's your, you know, that's your, that's your platform. And until you're Nora Roberts, like who can write whatever she wants. Like, you have to write what the audience expects of you. And I was like, okay, well, that's okay. And so Victorian forever. And if you get crazy, maybe a Regency. But, like, let's <laughs> talk about it. <laughs> so, so I, I uh, yeah. So oof, you are coming out then with the seventh book of this series <laughs> <laughs> this year. And, I mean, have you found some – excitement and fun, you know, continuing what you didn't think you were going to continue with? Or how has that process been for you? Um, it, I think it was frustrating at, at first, just because I, I was like, Oh, you're putting me in a box. I don't know how to live in this. And then I realized that I created this world with these guys that I love. And that I knew the rules of and the parameters of and so it was fun for me to kind of spread their world out into like the book I'm writing right now is about uh chief inspector Morley who he just was like sort of thrown in to the first book to be not the hero you know like he was just this guy that I'm like mm-hmm. he, he's just like the boring guy that she doesn't choose because she she has to like be in love with this dark you know the underworld you know and now He's this fully formed like man that I've wanted to write forever. Well, not forever, but but once people started asking for him, and once people are like, he's so interesting, and then he kept popping up as like this sort of antagonist Mm -hmm. to these men, and like then they started having fun banter, and then they started like then they started sort of getting along, and then he, I'm like, what if he has a weird past? And then you know, 
all of a sudden I'm like, oh, he needs love. Like he needs a what? He's so lonely, <laughs> and his heart is broken, and he's alone, and he like runs the whole police station, and like he just works too much, and he's so sad and alone. Why? And now I'm giving him, you know, this fun past, and well, not fun. It's actually terrible, but like. <laughs> 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 but like it's just so I'm having such a great time. I I I I deviated from the rebels for a while to write this other trilogy, which I enjoyed. But I am so happy to be mm-hmm. back in this world that I didn't even think. I mean, I still want to write gladiators, but you know, I think that's so fun. Just because, like, as an avid reader of romance, I'll read these series, and after like a couple books, I'm like, is the next book going to be this side character that I loved so much? <laughs> and it's like, yes, I, I do that too. I read one series and I was actually, I stopped reading the series partly because there's so many other books I wanted to read, but also too, because I kind of got out of the loop. Cause I'll go on like book binges where I'm like, I have to read the series. Mm-hmm. The books are already out. Like I'm going to read the next one and the next one. Cause I want these, I want to read these characters, happy endings. Right. And then this one series I was reading, I can't remember what it was. All of a sudden, like four books in, it deviated to side characters I'd never heard of. Uh, and they were like the yeah. main people in the book. Uh-huh. And I was like, who are these people? I don't know these people. I want that guy's story. Yeah. And I like scrolled through all the books and he didn't have a story. Yeah. And I was like, but but he's the one I want to read right now. I mean, that, to be fair, that might not have been the author's fault because like I've turned in Morley's story for every proposal I've done and every contract I've wanted to sign and have been told like, mm-hmm. he's not a Duke. He's not hero material. Like he's not, nobody wants to read about a llama, you know? And I'm like, I have all of these emails that say differently, but I don't know. <laughs> you know, they were sort of like, unless there's a Duke on the cover or unless they're, you know, eh. what are you going to like? No, not Morley pick someone else. And so I've been like, okay, sorry, Morley, you go back in the drawer, go back in your office and be lonely and sad. And yeah. So now, you know, I get to I get to finally do it, which I'm very excited about. But I think a lot of that happens, you know, sometimes you're told, no, you can't, we're not going to publish that. So yeah, and I get that. But it's still disappointing for me as a reader. <laughs> <laughs> well, then we should write to the publishers, I think, is the, <laughs> is the way we can do that. Review, review the books and write to the publishers. Uh, <laughs> although, you know, a lot of us must in order to probably make anything happen. But so you also mentioned the new series that you are doing. And uh, with that is the, oh my God, the name escapes me. It's the oh. How to Lose the Duke of 10 Days. Oh yeah, the, the, series the Devil name. You Know is what they- The mean. Devil You Know series, yes. And so we did a list of 2020 historical romances we just can't wait for. And we <laughs> had one of those books on the list. I somehow didn't, I missed Captain Morley's book. And when you mentioned it, uh, when we were talking before the interview, I like freaked out because I was a huge Captain Morley fan. <laughs> so I was, I was definitely one of those. I was like, yes, he gets his story. Um, so I don't know how I missed that one. But do you also have books coming out this year for that series as well? Yes, uh huh. I have the second book in that sk- series, All Scott and Bothered. Oh, such a good name. <laughs> such <laughs> such a good name. I'm very excited for that one. <laughs> Yay! That one's coming out in September. So excellent. My mm-hmm. birthday month. Perfect. Uh-huh. Thank you for giving me that gift. <laughs> and I believe much. that I saw the the third one is called The Importance of Being an Earl. Mm-hmm. Yes, That's and that one title. <laughs> that, I guess I don't have a publishing date for that one. I I wrote them six months apart from each other, and so I erroneously assumed they were going to be released six months apart from each other. So I thought they were coming out in March and September of this year, and then oh. um, that was not the case. <laughs> so I don't have a published. <laughs> I listened to another podcast with authors and they were talking about it. They're like, yeah, it's interesting when you publish a book because your public, once you like write the book and give it to your publisher, you're not in charge of anything anymore. Yeah. Like they make decisions <laughs> and they'll like, they'll pick the release date and uh-huh. I just get informed of these things. Yeah, pretty much. Well, and it's, it's crazy too because sometimes you forget, like I'll have written probably three or four books because I turned All Scott and Bothered in last April. And so, oh, no. yeah. And so, like, there will be times when people will be like, when you were writing the scene, what were you thinking? I'm like, I don't remember what I ate last, yes, for lunch. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> I have to go back through and read the book when it comes out again so that I can remember, okay, this guy's the guy that did this. And he, you know, and I have to pull quotes <laughs> so that when people ask me about the book, I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> like, oh, so that I don't love that all of the time. Whereas Morley, I mean, I'm going to finish it in May and it will be out, or excuse me, March, and it'll be out in June because I'm putting it out in D. So 
that will be mm. oh. easier for me. Very cool. I mean, and that was some of the things that we were really interested in knowing because I know that you've done a combination of self-publishing and traditional publishing. So, and we've talked some about the self-publishing and how you started off in that, but what's been the hardest part of self-publishing for you? Um, I think it's the ever-evolving world of what self-publishing is. Because when I put my book out, uh, my novella, let's say, when I when I published... I think it was 20, 2012 or 2013. And it was basically like, there were something like 1.8 million books on Amazon at the time. And wow. that was nothing. I mean, now there's like, what, 18, 20, 30 million books. I can't like I have to. So it was way before the rush. And I put out this tiny novella and it did well. Like the first the, f- the first uh, month I was able to like pay my car payment and I almost died because I was so happy. And then I put out the second book and the, th- or well, novella and the third novella. And by the time the third novella came out, I was making triple my monthly salary as a government employee. And so I was like, oh. this is never going to end. Like I quit my job and you know <laughs> I mean? like, I'm going to be a millionaire in a year. And and, um, but then, you know, rushes happen and people with better business minds than I figure about more better advertising and better social media. Pres- and, and then mm-hmm. all of a sudden you have to be like president, CEO, PR marketer, tax specialist, Instagram mm-hmm. influencer, like, and you have to, you know, something new is introduced all of the time. And the more people that publish, the more difficult it is to, to kind of swim through that like glut in the marketplace to find your readers anymore. And so I think that was the most difficult thing for me was wading through that. So I was very lucky, I feel like, to find a New York engine that has their own marketing teams and their own distribution channels and be able to rely on them as well because I didn't have and I still don't have the the genius that it takes for some of friends of mine even that that are that do so well in the indie market because they have that whole brained approach where they can Mm -hmm. juggle the business side of things so very well and also write fantastic books. It sounds, it sounds overwhelming and it it also sounds very relatable, (laughs) relatable (laughs) as, as a podcast. I mean, like that's something that is very difficult to do, you know, coming from, from zero and I think in any industry and trying to break in and find success, whatever success means, you know, if it's paying your Mm -hmm. car payment or it's being able to quit your job or it's just you know, finding fulfillment, you know, there's so many different Mm -hmm. levels um, of success. But even, you know, there's so much relatability with the the Amazon marketplace versus even just like Apple podcasts or any sort of podcatcher, like to be able to be discoverable and to be found. It's more and more there are these big companies like Spotify that's doing crazy things in the industry, um, or even just some of the podcast networks that are so big. And so unless you are a celebrity, or a um, kind of an established person or working with one of these big networks, you're not going to find yourself on the discover pages right. of these apps. Um, yeah. So it's kind of a pay to play marketplace. Yes. And or you have to f- exactly what you're saying, like have some sort of incredible social media something. And it's, it's such a game. And I also just find it like, really interesting and fascinating. I work at a a social media company, basically. And so, you know, we're, my company is trying to create a new social marketplace similar to a Facebook. And um, we talk about that a lot about how, how can we make it so that anybody can have success Mm -hmm. and that they can be discoverable and that they can make money online. So, I like that there's noble intentions out there. And I know that we can't be the only people looking for that. But the reality of it is that right now there's so much out there and it's so hard to really find what you want and Mm -hmm. to find success if you are the artist, shall we say. So Well, it's so difficult too, because like that pay to play is is a huge thing has become just, I would say in the last year or less. Um, you know, Amazon has come out with their like pay-per-click AMS services and Facebook is doing the same thing. So now it's not just like, I just throw books out there and I figure out kind of this certain, you know, it used to be kind of like, well, how often do you do a sale and how often do you, 
you know, where, where can you make noise for everything? Now it's like, you don't even get the noise made for you unless you pay them for Mm -hmm. advertisements Mm -hmm. to be put on certain lists or for, for the visibility that you need for their algorithm, you know, like all of that is, I mean, it breaks my brain. I just don't, I'm not very good at it, to be honest. So I, you know. Yeah. I think that's kind of just where all this technology is going Mm -hmm. right now. And it's, you know, it's funny because the businesses are trying to like build their algorithms to, because they want to make the most money. So they're like, we're building the algorithms to make these things popular and it's going to help everybody. And it's like, no, it's only helping a select few people because you're like the algorithms, like I'm not going to say they're flawed, but they are flawed in a sense. Yeah. But because, you know, you can't put in all the factors. So it is difficult. And I wish like in some cases you could go back to something like a little old fashioned, like for myself, like even just trying to I'm going through like a renaissance of self right now, trying to figure out like where I'm going in life. <laughs> I love that. And, but even just like trying to get a face to face meeting with someone mm-hmm. is like, you know, I send a resume out, I send a cover letter out, I don't even get a response. And it's like, I'm a great person. Can you just talk to me, please? <laughs> right. Like, do I have to go knock on the door of the company and be like, hi, come talk to me? <laughs> I think you're like, I'm the person you want. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's kind of what you had to do. You used to pound the pavement, right? You know, like, it's been, a, yeah. it's been a long time since I've gone to look for a job because I did work for the government for 10 years and I've been writing for five years. But like I used to like when I was 16 or whatever and I used to try to go get a job, I'd like go into the, you know, I'd fill out the online application or whatever. And then I'd go into the thing and be like, here's I filled out this application. Here is also my resume. And my mom taught me actually, you know, to do that kind of thing. I never I never applied for a job I didn't at least get interviewed for or get the job. Because they had my face. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I cold called someone. Yeah. And I was like, hi, I really like, I heard you hired someone recently. I don't know if you're still hiring, but I really want a job here. And they're like, who is this person? And they're like, okay, <laughs> come out. And they're like, oh, wow, she's great for the job. And I was like, see, there you go. Uh, yeah. And I just called someone because I was like, I want to work for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I just feel like I wish you could do that. I wish you could still, you know, I wish that was still mm-hmm. a thing. And I, that's why I love podcasting though, because you can, or even video casting. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I don't love it. I never do it, obviously. But like, <laughs> <laughs> I get so shy, but I, but one-on-one, I just think it's so great to be able to have that human connection and that help. And since that's kind of gone, you know, gone the way of the world, I think mm-hmm. it means even that much more these days. My grandfather always said, there's no harm in asking. The worst they can say is no. (laughs) So I'm with you guys. Like, go out there and, you know, pound the pavement, uh, whether it be virtual or physical. And a good combination, I think, is is the way to go. And it's just, uh, it's hard out there. And I think that the rejection, right, can lead to kind of this hesitancy uh, to do it. Because if you constantly feel that of like, well, why am I not hearing back? Or why am I not having success? Or why is my product not being shown? It's like, should I keep doing this? And there a lot of self doubt creeps in. And I think, you know, for us too, with with a podcast, you look at numbers and reviews and feedback, and you kind of can easily feel the same way. Because you're like, well, am I doing enough? Is this enough? Should I keep at it? I'm not trying to say that, you know, we're having second thoughts about our podcast. We love our podcast. But (laughs) that that doesn't mean that we don't have those thoughts. And I can only imagine that as an author, it's very similar with only with, you know, pitching things you want to write and hearing back that maybe that's not what they want you to be writing right now. I, I, I just don't know. How do you overcome those moments? Um, I feel like I'm a bad person to ask for that because I, I have never not faced rejection. And so I don't think I have a healthy fear of it. And I didn't realize that that was a huge part of the, the artist struggle until I started hanging out with other writers and, you know, they're like, we never listen. We never read our reviews because I just, that will, that will put me out of commission for a week. Or if I get rejected, I have to, you know, like salt my, my meals with my tears, you know? And like, (laughs) and I just, I just went into this whole thing. I, I read a lot of books by other authors because I'm like, this is what I want to do with my life, obviously. And I mean, from the very beginning, my, my parents were very like, please have a backup plan. Please go to college. Please, like, no one makes it as a writer. Don't do this. And um, and I kind of did. 
but then I just took writing classes, you know, like I went to college, then I just was mm-hmm. like, well, I'm going for English. And I don't know if I it, like failure just kind of wasn't an option. And everybody said like, I very much listened to when Stephen King was like, well, I used to put all my rejections on my wall with a nail. And like, once the nail was pulled out of the wall, I, I used a railroad spike or whatever, you know, and so I was like, okay, well, I'm going to get rejected mm-hmm. a lot. Because I know I'm not very good. And I know I have a lot to learn. And like, you learn from failure. And so I just expected to fail a lot. And I still expect to fail a lot. And I'm still surprised when anything ever goes well. So I feel like, um, <laughs> you know, when someone's like, we like it, we'll take it. I'm like, what, really? You know, like, oh, great. Because I, <laughs> I look at everything I do and see gigantic flaws in it. And so whenever anybody tells me there's a gigantic flaw in this, I'm like, well, you know, they're not telling me anything. I don't know. So I just, <laughs> I just listen. I just listen and try not to let it bother me too much. It starts to bother me when someone says, I want you to be other than you are, or... Mm-hmm. they start messing with things early in the process. Like I've learned to be very precious with my, with my little baby ideas and mm-hmm. absolutely mm-hmm. iron skinned with things that are finished because when my ideas get batted out of the air by critique partners or brainstormers or that kind of thing, where they're just like, this whole thing won't work. I'll be like, yeah, but, but like, I've always been told that I've always been told, don't write about a guy with amnesia. That's ridiculous. Don't write about a guy who's, um, who's an assassin, who's going to kill, you know, kill women and is, has violent, like is violent against women. That's not going to work. And I'm always like, I'm just going to go ahead and do it anyway, you know, and it <laughs> ends up working out. Okay. So I, if I start listening to those voices that say, don't do that, don't think about that. Don't even start that. That's where Mm -hmm. I start to, Mm -hmm. to feel paralysis. That's where I start to feel like maybe all my ideas are bad. And like, maybe this, you know, maybe the world has changed too much. Maybe I'm wrong. But if I go ahead and try to go with my initial ideas and get to the very end, that's when I can get all of the feedback and the criticism and just be like, okay, okay. (laughs) But I think that you actually are an excellent person to ask about that because you have such a maybe such a less traditional feeling about it. And I think that it is really important to to think that way as much as possible, right? To not let our our insecurities and not let criticism take us down, but to translated in our heads, you know, some, some people are, aren't great at giving criticism, right. but you got to take that criticism and say, okay, well, what can be the next step from here? Be it, a, a you know, as simple as a, a revision and actually changing something or like, how do I go about this process differently in the future? And like you said, like guarding your baby ideas very carefully. So I think that that's brilliant. And I'm going to remember that and try to think of that the next time I'm hard on, my, hard on myself. <laughs> yeah, just, I know. I'm like thinking to myself, I was like, okay, uh, Kelsey, next time when you shoot your own idea down before you even like, f- like flesh it out, like maybe flesh it out first and then like see where it goes. Yeah. And then also you yeah. can think of options too. Cause like, what are my options? What's worst case scenario? I always go to the worst case scenario. I have an anxiety disorder. Like I think the world, the sky is falling all the time, but Oh, me too. Great. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> Sh- so cheers. maybe that's it too. Like maybe part of it's like, oh, you didn't like my thing. That's okay. I didn't, my, my brain didn't explode today. So like, I'm calling it a win, you know, like I didn't have a weird aneurysm Aww. and I didn't, you know, like I was able to go to the grocery store and not die. Like that's like a good day, you know? Yeah. Yes. So part of that for me is also taking your options into account. Like when my, when my agent said, I can't sell a paranormal. These would be good paranormals maybe, but what do you want to do? Do you want to publish right now? Do you want New York right now? Do you want to hold on to these? Do you want to write me something else? Or do you want to change them into something I can sell right now? Do you want paranormal to wait till paranormal comes back around again? What are your options? What do you want? And then I had to figure out, okay, well, what do I want and how much work am I trying to do to get what I want? So I think that can be a better way to approach these two where it's not like my whole self is being rejected. It's just, okay, well, what, what I wanted is out of my reach right now. So what, what can I do to work around that? You know? Definitely. Definitely. 
And you've done, I think you've done that so brilliantly. It sounds like already over your career, you know, with changing up the Victorian Rebel series and self-publishing some some things of your own when you wanted to get those stories out of there. And I think you've also recently self-published a mystery. Uh-huh. Yes. And that was another thing where I just got tired of the rejections. And that, and I did that there too. Like <laughs> everybody, I sent it to everyone. You know, I sent it to all, all of New York. I sent it to the Amazon and a lot of people read it. And a lot of people said, I think we will publish this except for you need to change the whole thing. Oh, you yeah. know, I had somebody tell me like, well, I had multiple people tell me in New York, like, okay, well, her job is too bloody. Her past is too dark. Her, her outlook is there's just too much blood on the page and she doesn't have a, like a good enough sidekick, you know, and maybe there's too much romance or there's not enough romance. Like we don't know, you know, like there was just, there's all of, mm-hmm. all of this feedback that you get that you're kind of like, why don't instead of Jack the Ripper, because that doesn't make a New York Times bestseller because he's so overdone. Why don't you do Sherlock Holmes? Well, I'm like, well, are you kidding me that you don't think Sherlock Holmes is overdone? And trust me, like I watch every, <laughs> every Sherlock Holmes thing that ever comes. Cause I love it. But or, you know, or why don't mm-hmm. you make her the plucky sidekick to an actual hero? Like she's, you know, uh, <laughs> and so no, I kind of, <laughs> you know, take some of the blood off the page or take some of this. So all of that feedback to me was like really frustrating because I'm like, okay, well, I've had this job in real life, number one. And mm-hmm. no, like this is what I wanted to write about, you know, and then they're like, we'll make it more women's fiction, less romance, make it more romantic, less mystery, make it more thrillery, less this. And so it just, I got tired of that feedback and it did hurt. I'm not saying I didn't go like, Oh, really? I wanted you to take it. Like I've had moments where I'm like, okay, well I have to process this this rejection for a minute. But then I just realized like, okay, well I'm not willing to do the work to this character, to this series that you guys want me to. So I'm just going to go ahead and go forward with it. And then I will keep in mind what you're looking for later in case something like that comes yeah. comes out of me <laughs> but but Fair. yeah that was that was a lot of rejection so wow. and some of it was even this is this was great but it probably should have been written better like I actually got a rejection letter that was like this was good but it wasn't as good as I hoped it would be and we're really picky about our authors to like no and I had to be like okay well ouch but fine I'll do better next time you know hopefully maybe not <laughs> maybe I won't who knows I like this can-do spirit. <laughs> yeah. It's very inspirational. Oh <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And uh, yeah, of course you're not going to write her as the plucky sidekick. <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> no, I just, oh, yeah. Got a little, oh, goodness. Yeah. yeah. I was. I had a thought about that that I wanted to say. She's stuck on the plucky sidekick. I am. I'm still upset about that. <laughs> See, that's my problem is that I like can't let things go when I get like on my righteous high horse. But um, I have this tiny activist living inside of us that just gets so mad about so many things. I just feel like <laughs> oh, she sure does. She just wants everyone to listen. <laughs> But I said high horse. So that made me think of something in your first book in the Devil You Know series, the first scene where we're unloading a horse from a train. And Kelsey and I are both horse girls. So (laughs) and I also lived in the Middle East briefly. And so you had this this mention of the heroine, like having seen a camel herder, you know, calm a camel uh, that was trying to run away by turning it into a circle. And I just really wanted to know, like, where the inspiration for that scene came from or or how that came about because um, it was thrilling i am no longer a horse person but when i was younger i was a horse person and i i had a little like ah. spike of anxiety because that's not the first scene that i thought we were going to talk about because that's not the first scene i usually get oh, asked gosh. about that book um uh, oh well you know okay <laughs> um, yes. but i we really enjoy when equestrian scenes are written well and they stick with us like very what much yes. <laughs> yes um but i had a horse from the time i was 12 to the time i was 17 and so i that was what i did you know in high school and i did mostly yeah. western writing and that kind of thing but and i didn't compete it was just pure like i said i want a pony and i went out and got a job and bought a pony <laughs> like Oh, like nice. I just that she was like my best pony and I loved her so much. And then I bred her and her son was half quarter horse, half Mustang and just like the most beautiful. And so I wanted to learn to train. So I was learning <laughs> to train him. So that's where I learned it is when I had this really cool mm-hmm. kind of like old salty cowboy was teaching me how to train this new horse. And, mm-hmm. and that's sort of where I learned some of those 
tricks of the trade, but I can't say I ever got to like mastery level because I, our very first time with him out on a road, cause we just kind of lived in the back country in the mountains and like a car went by and honked at us and the horse bolted uh, and fucked me cars. off. Yeah. And it was just some a car full of kids and I got bucked off and I broke my hip and I got a really bad concussion because it was like on the, on the road yeah. and he was really tall. It was a tall horse and I just lost my seat. And so I had to sell my horses and I was like laid up for months and I had to do like a, a semester of high school, like from home because I couldn't walk. And oh my God. Yeah. So it was like, I, I did end up after I graduated high school, like working at a dude ranch and getting back on horses sometimes, but I've never owned them again. And I haven't ridden them probably, yeah. you know, seven to 10 years. So I just get to when a friend invites me over or whatever, but I do have a little bit of that in my memory still that I can pull from. It doesn't go away. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, it doesn't. And I think it because so so I I was a trainer for seven years and Kelsey is still doing horses professionally. And so we we both are just the kind of people, you know, when someone writes about the thing you do, you kind of just can immediately tell if they have some personal experience with oh, it. Yeah. <laughs> and that scene felt very much like this person has has seen this, has felt this, you know, kind of mm-hmm. maybe not this exact thing, but they have some knowledge with it. So it's just, it's always exciting to hear. So yeah, I thought I, I found that scene thrilling. Okay. And you know, the other scene that that I imagine you're talking about uh, is probably the prologue mm-hmm. of the book. Uh, to comment on that, uh, I started reading that book one morning before work uh, and I was sitting at breakfast and my husband tried to talk to me and I was just like, don't talk to me right now. <laughs> like, I am reading. <laughs> it was a very much like, you cannot interrupt me. I have a limited time here. I did not know what I was getting myself into, but I have to keep going. <laughs> so it's a really, um, I, I'm trying to think of the right word. I guess poignant is the closest I can come way to start a book. That's it just, a kind it, word. It definitely. That's one of the <laughs> kinder words that have been used. <laughs> well, yeah. And I, I imagine it's not for everyone. But it worked for me. I felt like immediately I was just in the book and I understood the character. And maybe if someone hasn't read one of your books before, they aren't expecting that right off the bat, you know, or or just the, I should say they aren't expecting kind of that honesty right off the bat, maybe, you know, and that raw moment. But I, I, I found it to be obviously like heartbreaking and hard, but I really love when a book can be heartbreaking and hard. And you see, you see the, the healing and you see her rise above and you see her get her happily ever after. Thank you. I, I, I wasn't, I think aware of what I was getting myself into when I wrote this, cause it was like, it was an emotional thing for me to write, but also I wanted to kind of be like, look how, yeah, redemptive and, you know, healing things can be. And I tried to be very careful with how I was sort of like, this is coming, like this train is coming at you, put the book down if you can't, you know, if you don't want to read it. And and mm -hmm. I've gotten everything like emails from everything from like, this is this book like helped me on my healing path and like you spoke to me and I cried and I loved it. And it's the best book I've read in a long time to like, I think you're glorifying child rape and should be in prison kind of thing. So it's like, I don't, again, you know, I'm kind of like, well, I wrote it. Um, a lot of people will say, you obviously don't know, like you don't have any right to write about that or whatever, because this is not, the usual case of how a victim would act. And I feel like that's a very bold statement for people to make. And I don't think there is a certain way that a victim should act. So that's another thing I was kind of trying to write about where I was like, what about a woman who had something terrible happen to her and created a wonderful life instead, who where she was a whole human being without a man, without love, without even really much of a sexual, Mm -hmm. she would have had a great life had the hero never come into her world. She had a family, she had best friends she had a job she loved and was good at and venerated for like she was and she also was a victim of rape like that was a very that was a part of who she was but it wasn't who she was kind of thing that was important to me i i mean i i loved the book so i completely agree with your 
choices there. <laughs> but I just so disagree with the statement that someone said to you of a victim wouldn't act that way. Many people, like many you said, people have said that. I, yeah, and I, yeah, and I just don't. I get that. Like everyone's experiences are different, mm-hmm. and everybody chooses to take bad things and turn them into whatever they do. Like there's no, there's no right way to do it, and like. People do great things all the time after bad experiences, Mm -hmm. like, and feel fulfilled, like, in spite of the bad experiences, like, they take them, that's part of who they are, and then they have a life beyond that. Right. Well, and I think in this particular case, it's so off the mark for me, because I could maybe see that argument if she had a long history of abuse, Mm -hmm. right? And all of a sudden, she snapped. But we've seen that also Mm -hmm. in writing. You know, we've seen Mm -hmm. that in books. We've seen that in stories. But maybe that I feel like that argument would be stronger if she had that kind of history of abuse. You know, we argued it in in the same way, but different in um, Romancing Mr. Bridgerton, which is like such a sweet, happy, fluffy, light book. Mm -hmm. But Kelsey's point was like, well, but Penelope never stood up to her mother. Her mother was constantly berating her and belittling her. And at the end of it, Colin had to stand up for her. And I said, you know, well, but she's had this life of abuse by her mother. Mm -hmm. So she has a certain kind of programming that is very difficult to, you know, and some people can be like snip snap and then they tie, you know, cut ties and other people can't. Yeah. And she she was fighting back in her own way because she had a publication where she wrote under an assumed name. But like maybe her heroes talking to her mother like that is the catalyst for her in that case. So, you know, that was the argument. But for me, like saying that your character, I I don't know, it just is to me, it seems like such a reaction. She was a strong, smart woman who had something bad happen to her and she tried to get out of the situation and something bad happened I, I don't know. It just seems to me like I totally disagree. <laughs> I <just laughs> and I, totally and disagree. I and I get like I I understand where they come you know where they come from too because maybe their experiences were different mm-hmm. or their expectations are different and that's not what they want to read and so I'm never like yeah, you mm-hmm. have to like this because you know but I'm also kind of like that's the story that's mm-hmm. her story that's what happened to her and so that's yeah. you know and I've also I've also been really asked for trigger warnings. And that's something I'm I, I'm mm-hmm. going back and forth on also as well because I had a weird yeah that I have weird I have squeaky feelings about it on both sides you know yeah I, I understand that and I saw one author who recently who said that they put them on their website so if you like wanted to look into it you could go there but not within the book mm-hmm. um, because I agree like. If you see that and you know that going into it and you didn't necessarily need that trigger warning, you might not experience the book in the same way. Uh And the other side of the coin is if you do need that trigger warning and do want that trigger warning and you and you see it, then you maybe experience the book in a different way. Right. So I mean, it's it's just I understand that it is a that's a it's a difficult thing to kind of decide on. I go, I it's a I have complicated feelings about it because I definitely see both sides. And I I also was kind of like, so in all of the books before this, I have realized Mm -hmm. that the worst things that I have ever done has happened to men Mm -hmm. or boys, yes, young children. And I have never been called on the carpet before, Mm -hmm. ever. And so I thought that was really strange, too. It was one of those sort of like, I wonder if there's a certain amount of like, unknown bias out there that readers might have about violence against women versus violence about against men and boys because I was not expecting the kind of reaction at all because I was like oh this is just a Kerrigan Byrne book like they'll expect that you know they'll they know what they're by now probably getting into (laughs) or whatever like I just because so often the beginning of like I I generally kind of do the HBO thing where I'm like the Mm -hmm. first scene is like blood and boob you know we call it death and boobies or whatever (laughs) like it's a lot of kind of sensational like dump you into like okay here's what you're getting into kind of thing and so the fact that you know I I always kind of wonder about like a certain gender bias there too about okay well you know I don't know yeah that makes sense though and the idea like a gender bias because I feel like people when you talk about like sex crimes against men and people are like that's not possible it's like yes it is because crimes happen to everybody like Mm -hmm. It's not just like one gender, like people do horrible things to people like that's just what happens. 
And, Uh you know, so to read it on the page, you know, it's heart wrenching and it's terrible, but like there's some kind of disconnect when it's happening to a man because you just like can't picture it happening to a man in some ways. And then but for a woman, that's just been a fact of being a woman for eons. That's always been our biggest. Right. I won't like, you know, it's always been the biggest fear. It's always been something we've been warned against Mm -hmm. forever. And so like it could be more triggering just because I feel like it's more real in people's minds versus on the other side, they, there's a bit of a disconnect simply because we just can't register that right. people are horrible to people. Well, and I have to say that that's yeah, one of the yeah. reasons, you know, and full disclosure, I'll just be very honest. I've never had any of these sorts of things happen to me personally. So I'm very lucky in that respect. And I'm coming from a place of bias because I don't have that experience, thank goodness, that would trigger me in maybe a deeper way that someone who's had a similar experience would. But that being said, when I read The Highwayman and I did get that backstory of Dorian's where he had had that abuse, I just found it so... I really appreciated it because I felt like it wasn't something that I'd heard before and not because it was a new thing and it was novel, but more just like, oh, here is someone who's bringing to light things that happened and saying like, it can happen to anyone. It doesn't matter who you are. And it has been happening to everyone throughout the ages. So, and it felt really real and raw. And I mean, I feel like I also connected to the male characters in those books in maybe a stronger way than I often do. You know, every book touches you a little bit differently. But so because I have maybe that history of having read The Highlander, or sorry, not The Highlander, I'm looking at The Highlander right now on my desk. (laughs) But The (laughs) Highwayman. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But because I've read The Highwayman, and I've also read The Highlander, actually. And I've read How to Love a Duke in 10 Days. I didn't find it incongruous with the way that you write and with what I was expecting of a story. I know I'm going to have maybe some some difficult things that I have to confront in the story. And that's what I actually think makes the story so powerful and so memorable. And I don't know, I just come away with kind of a, I don't know, a deeper sense of... Of a lot of things, um, which is not good to say in a podcast or just when you're trying to, when you're reviewing something and you say a lot of things, um, we could maybe do, can maybe do better. But, but yeah, no, I'm appreciative of it. And I don't know. I didn't think it was, I didn't think it was incongruous at all. Well, thank you. Well, I, I also like the idea of, I think sometimes men are told that they can't be victims or being victim isn't, you know, kind of emasculates them in some Mm -hmm. way too, you know? And so I, I don't know. I kind of liked the idea of the fact that some, that a man has felt helpless before or had to deal with that sort of situation and still could be thought of as alpha and manly and still had to, you know, maybe even overreacted to it and then still had to overcome the vulnerability and the, the like, heal the child inside of him. You know? <laughs> so I don't know. That's, I think that's a different, and then there's, also, I like to look at different things that were not considered in the past. Like you said, like Nina in The Highlander, like she may have been sexually abused, but like legally, mm-hmm. she wasn't. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so it's sort of like, I think those things are especially relevant today, too. So I like, I like to put something that's relevant today, maybe against the, the backdrop of when, of when it was magnified 100 years ago, you know, so that people can look at it through different lenses. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I digress. <laughs> well, I think we've all digressed, but that's the point. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, it's uh, actually digress, colon, the podcast story. I digress, <laughs> colon, the podcast story. <laughs> oh, goodness. Yeah, no, but um, yeah, this conversation's taken us on quite a quite a journey today, but I think it's been just really exciting and great. And I I feel like we could talk forever and ever. And so mm-hmm. we'll just have to do it again sometime if you're willing. <laughs> and uh, maybe after your next book comes out. Absolutely. Anytime. I just love talking to you. 
Anytime. Seriously. Well, we really have enjoyed talking to you. Agreed. Agreed. Um, <laughs> so your next book that's coming out is A Dark and Stormy Night, and that's Captain Morley's book. And or not Captain. It's Carlton. Sorry. Sir Carlton Morley's, right? Uh <laughs> You're fine. You know, yes. Uh huh. Yeah. He's a he is a knight. So yeah. He's start. He's he's third card Carlton Morley or Chief Inspector Carlton Morley. Yeah. So. Chief Inspector. Yes. He also, I'm. I'm very excited about that, and and I love the title. Oh, <laughs> thank you. I think there will be a couple knights K and I G H T S in the future because he's. Mm. I think he's recruiting. <laughs> <laughs> So. Oh, I do love that. <laughs> so Kerrigan, if people want to find out more about you, where can they find you? Um, pretty much everywhere. I Kerriganburn.com is my website. And then I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, kind of. I, I don't, I kind of stay away from Twitter. Like a lot of my Instagram posts go to Twitter. So I'm like, here's pictures of my dog <laughs> or whatever. But like, I'm not, you know, so yeah, I'm, I'm everywhere and I'm online way too much. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you mentioned your dog and we didn't get to talk about our dogs today, but we I all, know. I believe have lovely lady dogs. Oh, and do. so, yeah. Next time, next time. <laughs> That's okay. My my personal Instagram is like 90% my dog. <laughs> and then I like to just throw my cat in there for spice. So yeah. there you go. <laughs> my dog has her own Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, I thought about doing that. I did because I was worried about an inundation of of Willow pictures. So I was like, maybe Willow the writer dog like needs her own Instagram. And then I'm like, oh, this sounds like work. I hate no, <laughs> that's the worst idea I ever had, but it might, it might happen. So. I don't post to her Instagram very much anymore, but I, it's there. And it's a little, it's a documentation of, of the beginning of her life, which is kind of fun. So, so cute, <laughs> you know, but life, you're right. You gotta, you gotta balance that work life stuff and social media very quickly starts to feel like work, but I guess we're wrapping up here. So, um, I need to come up with a way to wrap us up. I guess it would just be by saying, Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you guys. <laughs> and I am looking forward to doing this again sometime in the future. Yeah, we had such a lovely time talking to you today. Thanks again yeah. for coming on and we can't wait to talk to you again soon. Okay, I'll talk soon. Oh my gosh, Lily, she's so nice. I really like her. I am so sad you didn't get to go to breakfast with us. This is the problem with us living in different cities. I know. What the heck, man? I know. <laughs> oh, but she really has such an interesting point of view, and I just love what her books kind of bring to my reading list. I feel like similarly to how Maya, when she was on our program, was talking about how she kind of chose a favorite book based on her mood. Mm -hmm. I feel like Kerrigan's books definitely have a different, you know, a different mood to them than a, a Tessa Dare. We always use Tessa Dare, but then a Tessa Dare. However, I really love having that juxtaposition. And I think she does something that not a lot of authors can do successfully. I 100% agree. I really, I've only read, sadly, the one book from her, but I was so involved in the story. Like I was in it to win it. Like I couldn't put it down. Mm -hmm. I loved every minute of it, but it was because like from you know, the prologue, I was on this emotional journey. And it's like, I couldn't do the characters the disservice of like putting the book away for a day. Mm -hmm. You know, it was like, I had to finish it because I was on this roller coaster ride with them. And I had to see it through till the end. And it's what I used to enjoy about fantasy books was because I could be taken on this journey. Mm -hmm. And I was so in like, raptured with the journey. Uh, if you haven't read her books, you probably think that doing a disservice explaining in this way. If you have read her books, I bet you agree with us. So <laughs> yes. And I, but I think that was just such a bit of her because even, you know, in this interview, like we went down a bit of a rabbit hole and, but that just was because like we needed to talk about her books because they threw us into a rabbit hole and we needed to keep going on it. Like, I just, yeah. And I feel, you know, I'm sure that's difficult to like have someone just like singing your praises and defending your, your books rather than maybe talking about a, a subject. But I just like couldn't help myself because 
hearing some of those things, I mean, it's really impressive, her resilience. And I think that her the resilience comes out in the characters. Her characters are so resilient. Mm-hmm. They have they've had a lot of no's um in in various ways in their books, but she's just such a beautiful writer too. And we didn't even get to that to like talking about we talked about redemption. We t- we, you know, we talked about resilience, but we didn't talk about her writing. And I'm going to read a little passage here from one of her books that I just read that I felt like was this moment of redemption, right? Uh, Mm -hmm. Where it's talking about their resilience and their redemption, and it just kind of summed it up in a really beautiful way. And she also just, you know, she just writes so well. So anyhow, this is from The Highlander, and it says, What a tragedy they both were bruised and beaten by those who were supposed to have loved and protected them, tossed upon a sea of cruelty and seeking refuge in this unforgiving world, seeking sanctuary, but hoping for redemption. Yeah, I just love it. And just also her attitude towards like even just publishing and like wanting to get her books out there and getting her ideas out there, like super inspiring, just super inspiring. And then on top of all that, it's just really frustrating that not only do you and I live geographically in different places, but like that she lives in a different place because how fun would it be if we all lived together and we could take our dogs on like right? hike, hikes together? Ugh. That'd be so great. Uh, I bet our dogs would even be <laughs> friends. <laughs> yeah, we are just so thankful for Kerrigan for joining us today. And we look forward to speaking with her again in the future. Absolutely. So first of all, call to action, pick up one of her books, do yourself a favor if you haven't already. Second of all, if you want to find out more about Kerrigan, again, you can find her on her website, kerriganburn.com. You can find her on Instagram at Kerrigan Burn, her whole name, and you can find her on Twitter at Kerrigan underscore Burn. Although, as she said, not as, not as prolific on Twitter. That's okay. But on Instagram, you get the dog pictures. So (laughs) yay. And then if you're looking to find us, you can find us at romancepod.com. You can also find us on Instagram at T and Strumpets. T is in Tom and is in Nancy Strumpets. We're also on Twitter at the same. And you can look us up on Facebook and you can even look us up by name on YouTube. And we also would love it if you would take the time to rate and review us. Reviews on Apple Podcasts really help us get found. And if you don't have an Apple product and you can't review us there, you can also review us on Facebook. So there's a way for everyone to do it almost, unless you don't have Facebook and then bravo to you. I applaud your <laughs> I applaud your lack of social presence. Um, but if you have a few extra minutes to do that, we are ever so grateful. We love to hear back from you guys. And we are just so excited at all of the growth we've had and all of the growth to come. And finally, in regards to that growth, Another thing you can do to help us out is to tell a friend. So if you're liking what you hear here today, we would love it if you would tell someone about that. Yes. Thank you so much. We love you all. So thanks again to Kerrigan. And Kelsey, we haven't talked about what we're doing next week. Oh, man, Zoe, what are we doing next week? So next week, we're going to be getting a little bit steamy in here because we are reading The Earl I Ruined by Scarlett Peckham. Okay. I don't know this author at all. This is going to be exciting. I am very excited for you because this book uh, took me by uh, flames, shall we say? (laughs) Um, So I am really excited to get to talk to you about it and discuss it with our listeners. Awesome. I'm excited to pick up something new. So join us next week as we read The Earl I Ruined by Scarlett Peckham. And may all your ever afters end happily. Tea and Strumpets is part of the Frolic Podcast Network. Find more podcasts you'll love at frolic.media slash podcasts. Your... Yeah, I know. Time. I'm screwing yeah. it up. Or is it on the... I'm trying to like read what we wrote and it's not there. <laughs> yeah. It's down below, Kelsey. Uh, so... <laughs> Uh, I'm like, all good morning. Good morning. Uh, I've been my favorite people already because now I feel like.
we're kindred spirits. Uh, 